They're the ones working alongside Mother Nature. They keep us fed and our economy afloat. But our farmers are ageing, which begs the question, who will take their place? When it comes to consumer convenience, Woolies and Coles take the crown. I think I think the perception is that people think it grows on the shelves of Woolworths and Coles overnight. <laughs> While Australia sleeps, we're dreaming of ways to put more fresh thinking in all our trays. While our bakers are pulling things fresh from the oven, our daily slice and the things we're all loving. The fresh food and veggies are... The attitude where our food comes from is very poor, I believe. People don't un understand the farming process. A lot of people think that our meat comes from a supermarket and that's it. It's just a lack of education in the general population about where their food comes from. People fundamentally understand that food comes from farms, but I don't think they understand like the process that food goes through. Like, you know, something that makes me really sad is that when people go to Woolies and <clears throat> there's like strawberry punnets on special for one dollar a punnet, and people are like, oh yeah, the bargain, you know, like let's take 20 punnets home, fantastic. But I don't think people understand, you know, that punnet probably costs 20 cents. You know, it costs someone 50 cents to put the strawberries in that punnet. Then you've got to pay for the plants, the water, the uh, fertilizers, you know, taking care of those strawberries. Like there's so much in that, that yeah, you got that for a dollar, but you know, it probably actually costs $2 to grow it. A lot of people think that farming is just put the crop in the ground and then harvest it. There is, that is not even a start. Philip Ram is a fourth generation farmer from Maruda and has been working the land since the age of 15. Here at his property northwest of Sydney, there is an abundant supply of citrus and stone fruit, alongside a few crops of tomatoes in the off season. But, but for the farmers markets, they want them like that. At 70, Philip runs this farm with the help of his brother John, but with no successes, the farming dynasty will unfortunately end with them. Even if they did, Philip says, it's a hard life that few would want to sign up to. The younger generation have seen mum and dad bash their head against the wall to try and look after their family and keep going and, and, and they really don't get the recognition for it that, 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 that they deserve. I mean, my mother sacrificed tremendous amounts. I mean, when, when her and my dad first got married, they lived in a shed, you know, and only a very small one, and she used to wash by hand and do everything. And they battled for many years. And that was in days when things were easier. It, it's harder now. I would not like to be a young person trying to start a farm now. The only way that farming could survive is through the really through the family farming system because it basically you're carrying on, on on top of someone else's work. The latest survey data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics found that the average farmer is almost 60 years old. It puts a spotlight on the number of young people entering the agricultural space. I caught up with a few farmers all under the age of 35 from across New South Wales. Most of them say that the path ahead is bright, but not without its challenges. All of them say that without the family farming system or generations passing on the land, the financial barriers for youngsters daring to give the farm a go are far too high. A few years back, if you would have told Christina Kelman that she'd be taking up the family farm, she would have told you that you're joking. But the 27-year-old has done just that, swapping her corporate career for life on the land. Uh, so I've got to clean up that section down here. So I'm going to do a bit of cleaning this afternoon and then 
might be able to plant it tomorrow. My parents kind of encouraged me to find another career and so I pretty much just tried to go as far as I could from the farm as possible. I moved into the city and then I moved overseas um, but it wasn't until the farm started to actually grow um, that my parents, now that my dad's 80 and my uh, my mum's almost 65, uh, they sort of were like, look, if, if this is something you want to do, now's the chance to jump back in. And I thought of it as a really, really great opportunity. I've always loved being on the farm, um, but also it's very, very difficult for young people to get into agriculture if they don't come from a family background. It's very, very difficult. And I thought that this was a, a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. Christina is one of seven but she's the only one to return to the farm out of her siblings. By taking up the organic vegetable farm located in Wallachia, west of Sydney, she's not only keeping a legacy alive, but bringing new skills to the table. Came with a lot of business knowledge. And so what we actually needed on the farm was not necessarily another labourer, um, but actually someone who could take the business forward. Because the truth is you can grow like the best kale in the world, but if you can't sell it, you know, you're just a good farmer, but you haven't made any money. She admits that there is some things she's had to learn along the way, like using machinery and fixing equipment. She's also learned that between Mother Nature and market prices, the weekly paycheck is not so weekly. People can idealise the farm life. And you know they, they look at the big open space and they see all these veggies and they're like, oh, it must be great. Like, you know, it's not always going to be like that. There's going to be times where um, you have to do everything yourself. There's going to be times where you can't pay the bills. There's going to be times where, um, yeah, like you just, it's not as ideal as you think it is. And I think, and I'm not discouraging people to go into it, but I think if you want to go into it, go work for someone who's doing it actually do the work and then spend a couple of years in it and then think if it's something that you want to do for the rest of your life because there's a very big difference between working for someone and getting a weekly paycheck for it versus you work for yourself and you have to somehow you know make this business work. The water crisis gripping New South Wales is now at emergency level. Day zero is approaching when rivers and dams will run completely dry. Even for a country like ours, well familiar with drought, the dry spell right now in Queensland and New South Wales is one of the worst in our history. It's the most gut-wrenching, physically, demanding, I didn't think that mental health was a real thing before the drought. I just thought it was a made up thing in the city. It was a made up thing for school teachers to use. But after going through the last three years like we did, it's real. And hence the reason why we have these young blokes around here, we have a tight knit group of blokes and, and their wives and partners too. And we used to try and catch up every week and that made such a big difference. Four hours west from Christina in Grenfell, New South Wales, Tom Matthews' pastures are regaining colour after three long years of drought. Mother Nature's a bitch. And there's no easy way to describe it, then that's it. You can go and spray a crop with a herbicide and you can get resistance. You can go and plough that weed into the ground and it still finds a way to reshoot and come back. Its genetics are going to be better. It's, a, it's quite challenging. Uh, she's a lot of fun. up the family livestock and cropping farm was always going to be on the cards for Tom. Uh, I was always going to be involved in ag. Um, 
it was I, I suppose right from when I was uh, when I was a young bloke I remember um, planting a paddock with my dad just over here actually and uh, I remember waking up it was diet and then phew, would have been uh, dark night time about nine or ten o'clock and he was filling up the cedar and I thought right this is what I want to do and I don't know I would have been about six or seven yeah Tom's fortune might not seem like much but the family farm is something that those starting out could only dream of. Um, that's a hard one because there's so many people that are ready to go farming and they're empowered, like you said, they want to be out here, but they financially can't do it. The deposit that a young farmer needs is near unreachable. It's even if they have a they have a wife and the wife works and, and he works flat out too and you know then you have other things thrown you get married and they have children and they're busy focusing on that and by the time they turn 40 or 40 or 50 or whatever they've finally got enough money but the land prices is three or four times as much as when they were trying to buy one when they were 25. It's a big issue. But in Canoundra, less than an hour drive from Tom, is a young farmer who seemingly conquered the impossible, buying farmland. David Ruffalo's property in central west New South Wales used to be a vineyard, but has now been converted into a free range piggery. The bricklayer turned farmer comes from a farming family almost five generations deep. The biggest uh, challenge I faced was buying my farm because to purchase farmland when you haven't got anything passed down to you is very hard. The price of land, how banks work, um, banks want 50% in cash for a farm and when you can't buy a farm for, you can't buy a decent farm for under a million dollars it makes it hard. Most teenagers don't know what career path to pursue but David was trying to buy farmland at 15. Well, with my own situation, I knew where I wanted to be as a kid. So I was trying to buy a farmland at 15. And I was turned away from bank at 15 saying, you can come back, come back and talk to us when you're 18 or your parents are going to guarantee you. And I'd done that. I went back at 18 to, to try and buy another place and I couldn't do it financially uh, without the parents' help. And I never wanted to include my parents' my parents' finances in mine because at the end of the day, if I, if I went broke, I wanted, to do, I wanted to do to be myself and myself only. And um, I invested in Sydney at 19. I bought, I bought the first property at 19, and I'd done a few things there in Sydney uh, as a bricklayer. I built, I cut up land. I, I'd done it, but not too bad, and I put out equity for my farm. So I bought my farm through equity. But the price of land doesn't seem to be getting any cheaper. In fact, it's one of the biggest obstacles standing in the way of young farmers. Like, I, like I'm, I'm 30 years old, um, I know one or two farmers my age doing the same thing. I know, I know a lot more younger people that would like to farm, but it's, it's impossible for them to purchase land. For David, securing farmland was no easy feat. It's a testament to his passion for the industry, one that he says he lives and breathes. Probably the perceptions that uh, the general public think about farmers that were backwards, that were stupid, when it's in incredibly wrong. Um, a farmer is one of the smartest, one of the smartest people you can meet. They almost do everything on their own, from their accountant to a mechanic to a vet to, to everything. Yeah, <laughs> they're dirty, they're dumb, they're old, and they don't know what's going on in the world. They're simple. Gretsch 
is another young farmer. However, his family has a stronghold in the potato and cabbage game. The family property in Camden, in Sydney's west, is under his guard, something he intends on protecting for the rest of his life. In the digital age, all things are moving forward. For Matt, this includes the farm. He's been a keen adopter of technology from GPS tractors to a live monitoring app. Like we use an app called Life Farmer and I can trace exactly where, like if, if a processor was to ring me and say, oh, this happened to this product, I, I could go, oh, that come from, you know, this bed on the farm. It got picked on that day, it was planted on that day, it was sprayed on that day, this bloke sprayed it, that's the rate. And I could never keep track of that unless I had something like that. While it might be a while before technology picks the cabbages for him, Matt says that he's looking forward to a future where robotics and artificial intelligence work to make the farm not only efficient, but sustainable. We're in a really unique position in Australian agriculture. Um, we're tech savvy, we have an abundance of arable land, um, we have some huge expanding markets on our doorstep. Jamie Lee Oldfield is passionate about the next generation of Australian farmers, heading the Future Farmers Network, an organisation dedicated to connecting young people with agriculture. She says that farmers have always embraced the need to improve on their techniques. It probably sounds like a bit of a cliche, but being a farmer is, you know, not that far removed from being a scientist a lot of the time. So a lot of people are naturally, a lot of farmers are just naturally inclined to wanting to learn new things, investigate how things grow better, um, whatever that may be, and are excited to find ways to improve. The former journalist currently lives and works on a commercial beef and cattle operation in Coolac, located in southern New South Wales. The tree change felt natural for Jamie as she grew up on a family cattle station back in South Australia. Jamie says that the path ahead won't be without its teething problems, but all in all, Australian agriculture has a bright future. Um, that'll keep improving and, you know, we'll, we'll probably take a few steps forward and maybe one step back as we go along but um, yeah I think there's there's some amazing technology out there these days that's going to make um, that has just changed the face of agriculture in the last 20 years and you know it'll be amazingly different again in another 20 years. When you do anything aside from, you know, maybe being a healthcare worker or something like that, um, it, you know, you'll quite often say, "Oh well, you know, it doesn't matter. We're not, we're not saving lives," um, which I think is something, you know, to manage your stress levels. It is good to remember that in day-to-day -day little practices that you're doing. But as a whole, um, being a farmer, we are, we are saving lives. My grandfather used to say that once in your life you need a doctor, a lawyer, a policeman and a preacher, but every day, three times a day, you need a farmer. <laughs>